Hi VC, James here. Welcome to another instalment of my series from the collection. So today uh, I'm going to be talking to you about hard rock and heavy metal. Now I grew up in the 1970s and um, I didn't, I wasn't exposed to a lot of kind of heavy music. Um, I did, however, get into Queen quite early on when I was, I think, um, I was six when that album came. This this album was Queen's kind of return to a heavier sound after um, Day at the Races, which had been quite a soft album. This was their attempt to get back to being a kind of heavy rock band again, and it contains two really heavy tracks. The track Sheer Heart Attack, which is actually probably more of a kind of punk new wave thing than it is metal as such, but we're talking about hard rock and heavy metal. The other track off here is It's Late as well, which has um, a kind of heavy guitar sound. You can't deny Brian May, I don't think. I mean, Queen were never really a metal band as such because they had lots of different ingredients in their music, but certainly Brian May, metal was his favourite kind of music, you know, kind of always was, and he always brought that to the fore. So from an early age, I was, you know, I knew what heavy music was like. I, you know, I liked it, um, but I hadn't really been exposed to heavy metal yet as such. Um, my dad had this record in his collection, and I heard this round about, probably about 1980, 1981. I think I'd just gone to high school. And um, my dad had a few records in the house. And he played me all these records. And I kind of liked all of them, except for this one, strangely enough. I didn't, I, I wasn't really ready for this, I don't think, uh, when I heard Robert Plant's kind of uh, howling singing and the kind of crunchy guitars. I don't know, there was something about it. I just didn't quite get it until much, much later on. Um... But, when, in about, I'm not sure when it was exactly, kind of early 1980s, a band who had been a kind of serious heavy metal band came along uh, in a slightly more pop format. They kind of reinvented themselves. Can you work out who I'm talking about? They had a couple of big chart hits. First with um, the song All Night Long. This is Rainbow, of course. This is the Down to Earth album. Uh, and then a really big hit from the Difficult to Cure album, and that was um, I Surrender. And this was a really important record for me because until this point I had mainly been a fan of just new wave stuff actually. Um, and when Rainbow came along I remember thinking, ooh, I'm getting into slightly tougher um, territory now and I don't have it unfortunately anymore but this record came complete with a uh, like a gift uh, voucher thing where you could send off for various gifts and they had various things like uh, leather studded things for your wrist and and, uh, and patches and in fact the first denim patch I ever had was rainbow I had a big orange patch with a guitar coming out of a rainbow that was the first time that I decided to try and kind of go down the metal route a little bit in terms of dress or you know what I was listening to, trying to kind of harden things up. The reason for it is that I had a cousin who I never saw, he was older than me, he wasn't interested in hanging around with kind of 10 year olds, 11 year olds, he was kind of 16, but he had a really amazing record collection. And in fact, his was the first proper record collection I ever saw. Um, it was in his bedroom, I would we would go and visit, but, but he was never there, he was always out because he didn't want to know, you know. But they would let me go into his room and just kind of look through his records, and he had this kind of amazing cabinet, just full of rock stuff, you know, rock, heavy rock, metal. I remember he had uh, the Heaven and Hell album, he had um, all sorts of rainbow, he had the Kiss, all the Kiss solo albums, which was the first time I'd ever seen those. And um, something about the idea of getting into rock and heavy metal started to dig its tentacles into me. And what happened was, in 1982, my favourite band, Squeeze, broke up, and I became very sort of disconnected and disillusioned with the pop charts after that. For some reason, I never got into the kind of British indie scene. I, I don't think I was even aware of it. All I knew was the top of the pops was kind of changing and turning into something else, turning into something that I didn't really like, you know. In the 1970s, in the late part of the 70s, there were a lot of good guitar bands, you know, just pop bands. And Top of the Pop seemed, it seemed made for uh, boys, you know. It was a boys thing. Pop music was a boys thing. The classic example I always give is, is um, Dave Edmonds. 
and uh, Rock Pile, you know, that kind of thing, Nick Lowe. It was just boys' stuff, you know. But in the 80s, it all went a bit, for want of a better word, I think, from my perspective, a bit girly. It all went a little bit hairspray. I don't need to talk about it. I mean, you know, we all know what happened in the kind of mainstream charts in the 80s. And I think I, I kind of sought refuge in metal and hard rock. But when I was in school, in high school, I became aware that some of the more kind of, um, not naughty boys in the class, but the ones who were a little bit more rebellious, um, were into ACDC. And I knew that because I used to see them drawing the ACDC logo on their exercise books. I'm sure everybody will have seen this, you know. And I was just kind of so intrigued by the name and the image. And um, so I started I started buying ACDC records. The first one I actually got was Power Age. Uh, and then I gradually kind of worked back and forwards and, and kind of, you know, started to collect more of their stuff. Um, there's no time here now to sort of, you know talk in great detail about, uh, just to get the light, uh, about ACDC, but they were a hugely important band to me because they represented the moment, I think, when I, I truly started getting into kind of heavy, heavy music, stuff that my dad kind of definitely didn't approve of. Um, he never particularly liked anything that I listened to anyway, but it was always, I think he could see the musical value in things like Squeeze and Wings and so on, you know. I've got a, second copy of Power Age. That's my favourite album by ACDC. But I think when it came to kind of this kind of music, kind of rock heavy metal stuff, and the imagery, you know, it, I mean it's just classic kind of teenage protest music, isn't it? I, I was about 12, absolutely perfect age, you know, to be getting into this stuff. You, you're trying to push the boundaries a little bit, another copy of Power Age. Um, and when it starts getting into the kind of, you know, satanic imagery and the kind of heavy stuff, you know, um, it, well, it's just kind of, it's perfect, it's perfect music for defining yourself against the enemy, isn't it? You know, the enemy being whatever, you know, parents and conformity, whatever, second copy of If You Want Blood. Um, actually, this was, this may have been the first ACDC album I ever heard. I had it on a cassette. Um, a friend of mine, I swapped it for something else at school, and I got a cassette of this, and a cassette of um, of this one as well. These records, my uh, my cousin Mark had them all in his collection, so I'd already kind of seen them. And it certainly seemed to me that to have a kind of serious rock collection, or a heavy metal collection, was something that would kind of allow you to um, kind of... Uh, escape into your own little world, you know, it was a definite alternative to the pop charts. It was nothing to do with hairspray, although it was later on, ironically. But it was it was it, it was nothing to do with the sort of the kind of pretty boy Duran Duran thing, you know. Uh it was just something much more um male, for want of a better word. That's the only way I can kind of describe it. So A C D C were uh a truly important band for me. I did see them live eventually, and um, I'm a big fan to this day. You know, I think I think Angus and Malcolm Young are very underrated as songwriters, with Bon Scott in particular. You know, brilliant lyricist. But uh, let's save that for for another video. Um, so yeah, and of course, as well as as well as ACDC, the other band that I got hugely into was Kiss. Now. When I was in uh, the top year of primary school, so I would have been about 11, we used to go on a school bus to go to the pool every week for a swim. And we had to join up with the other school in our village, that we, uh, which had older boys. And they used to get onto the bus, and one of the lads had that classic Gene Simmons um, blood spill patch on his denim jacket. And I was absolutely fascinated by this. And I got really into the kind of theatricality of KISS um, and very quickly started to build up a collection uh, of their records um, that's Dressed to Kill uh, really is one of the greatest kind of packaged records of all time isn't it I saw Brett recently uh, Vinyl Victim I know actually he was talking about the, uh, he was talking about Alive 2 uh, which I'll show in a minute um, then, of course, we have the classic uh, Destroyer. 
the wonderful Casablanca label, which always kind of helped to ensure that Kiss never really had any serious rock credibility, because of course it was a it was a disco label. There we have uh, Love Gun, uh, and then we have um, Kiss Alive Two, and I have. To I have told the story of this in a video elsewhere, but my, I've got this distinct memory. This is the incredible uh, gatefold which Brett, Vinyl Victim, was talking about the other day. Surely one of the greatest all-time gatefold pictures. But my grandmother, I remember her saying to my parents, Oh, don't worry, he'll grow out of kiss. You know, it, it, It's just a passing phase. And I distinctly remember saying, it was Boxing Day and we were in our house, and I just said, I will never grow out of Kiss. I will always be into Kiss. And um, it's perfectly true. I mean, I don't listen to them that much anymore, uh, but the music is in the blood, you know. Alive 2, Dynasty, not really a metal record. I talk about this record in my Sharp Left Turns uh, video if you're interested. I made a video a while ago called Left Turn Albums and I, talk about, and I talked about that one. That was when Kiss went a little bit disco. Then we have the solo albums which uh, like I say they were in my cousin Mark's collection. Aces, probably my favourite one. I'm sorry if the light is not best in here today but I'm just doing my best to show them. I don't want to take them out of the things because it just makes it go on too long. Peter Chris. Moving through. This was the last one I bought. I used to be fascinated by, uh, with this one. I, I used to look at it in the shop and you know it, it was such a great concept for an album cover uh, even though it's possibly not their, fi uh, their finest moment as a band. But uh, And then the infamous uh, Elder which, since joining the VC, I've been pleasantly surprised to hear people talking about it in glowing terms. I've gone slightly out of order, have I? No, I haven't. Kiss Killers, this was the first Kiss album I ever had. And it was a good one to get because it, it, it kind of mixed up some of the pop stuff from Dynasty with kind of some of the really early things, which were quite poppy as well, mixed in with some more of their kind of more heavy rocking stuff. So it was good because I was a pop fan, you know. Kiss always appealed to me because I think fundamentally they were a pop group and I sometimes think that's where the hostility sometimes comes from. Uh, I've known quite a few metal fans or rock fans over the years, Andy is the latest one, Andy, Cloudy Mild, but I've known other people who are very into heavy metal and rock and just have no time for Kiss at all, you know, and I sometimes wonder it's because they were sort of a pop band in disguise in a way, you know, they had a certain sound on the guitars but they were probably closer in spirit to the Beatles than they were say Iron Maiden. One of the greatest album covers of all time, I think Brett said that as well. Creatures of the Night, which is their return to form album where really. used to have uh, Animal Eyes, Asylum and Lick It Up and they've disappeared, I don't know where they are. So uh, Crazy Nights uh, is the last one from the collection there. Which was again their attempt to go a bit more kind of in the kind of pop direction, the kind of Desmond Child ballads and so on. So there we go, ACDC and KISS. So what's left? Well, when I was 16 I became good friends with a guy at Sixth Form College and he was really seriously into metal and rock and um, this really really impressed me. I was 16, the pop charts were still a complete no-go area. I think Rick Astley had just appeared as if from nowhere. Bross had appeared from nowhere, the kind of era of Stock Aitken and Waterman had started. All due respect to people who like that kind of music, uh, but it wasn't my kind of thing. And this friend of mine, Mark, he was really heavily into rock stuff, you know, and his his hero was David Lee Roth. And when I was 16, I got massively into David Lee Roth and this album. In fact, for about three or four years I was into this. I remember I passed my driving test and I used to drive around blasting this all the time. I had a little green and white Citroen 2CV with a retractable roof and you pull the roof back and drive around blasting uh, knuckle bones and just like paradise and you know the bottom line. Not really a metal album, it's more of a kind of, I don't know what you, how you describe this album, it's almost a bit sort of fusion-y, you know, it, it borrows so many different kind of 
genres of music. Um, and, but it's just a fun album. I know some people don't like it, but I mean, you know, Skyscraper by Dave Lee Roth, I just think it's a classic, you know, of its kind. And that got me to check out uh, the Van Halen catalogue to an extent. This is an album that I had back in the day, which I used to love. Um, Someone Get Me a Doctor is on this, Dance the Night Away. Nice stuff, you know, I mean, you can't argue with Eddie Van Halen. He kind of defined an entire genre of metal playing, and then of course you had Steve Vai doing something in the same ballpark, but perhaps even more advanced, even more flamboyant, uh, the first Van Halen record as well. Um, and my friend was also really into Robert Plant, and uh, that rubbed off on me too, and I started, I think I bought Now and Zen first, but I pulled this one out because it's kind of more of a heavy album really, it's him returning to the kind of Zeppelin sound. Um, so that helped me get back into, well, it, it kind of helped me understand that Zeppelin record that I hadn't understood when I was 10. You know, I think it's always interesting the way that cert, certain kinds of music make sense at certain times, you know, and you can be exposed to a certain kind of music and not get it, and then a few years later you can hear something else, and then it kind of fits together a bit better, you know. This album as well, everybody will know this one, White Snake 87, with a fantastic... Um, John Sykes on guitar, blistering guitar work on tracks such as Still of the Night and uh, Give Me All Your Love. I also used to love the track Looking for Love as well, which is a classic kind of 80s power ballad with this great kind of weeping guitar solo uh, from John Sykes. I know Dean Everest likes this album as well. I mean, it's, it's a kind of acknowledged 80s classic metal record. Now, this is the era, and I should briefly talk about this, but the era of uh, Tommy Vance who was a um, British DJ. I'm sure people will know about him, even in the States. I think he had a profile there too, but he had a brilliant, he had a wonderful radio show, the Friday uh, the, uh, the Friday Rock Show, which was a three-hour metal and rock show, uh, which used to start, I think it used to start at nine o'clock or ten o'clock on a Saturday, uh, uh, on a Friday night, and just kind of run through. And it was just a brilliant show, you know, you would play so many great things, and I was exposed to so many different kinds of music, a band that I learned about from his show actually was uh, the Scorpions, who I got fairly into actually. This is their second album, um, Fly to the Rainbow, which is actually, this is heavier than I remembered. I played it again not so long ago and I was surprised at how kind of uh, raw it is. The first track, Speedy's Coming, it really does pack a crunchy punch. Um, and I heard I heard this band along with countless others on the on the Tommy Vance show, and um, it's impossible to describe. This is the Scorpions again. It's impossible really to describe the atmosphere that that show had. If you if you know the show, you'll know what I'm talking about. There used to be a slot in the middle of it called "Lie Back and Enjoy It," where he would ask somebody to. Uh, you know, send in an idea for three tracks, and you would play the three tracks back to back, and it was lie back and enjoy it. And you, you just used to hear so much fine stuff on that show. And he was a classic kind of you know rock jock. He had a big deep voice, and he was all kind of like the Friday rock show. Um, and when you're sixteen, seventeen, and you're sort of hiding under your duvet because you're too scared to go and talk to any girls, you know, as I was, it um, it was a great it was a great place to go, you know. That's what rock and metal was for me at that age. It was a it was a a, a place that you could retire to or retreat to. It was a, it, its own little world, and I think I think to an extent that's largely still the appeal of it for a, a lot of people. You know, it's a kind of self-contained world, and often you can you know you have the sort of the fantasy imagery and the mythical stuff going on. I mean. A classic example would be that, that kind of thing, you know, Halloween, Keeper of the Seven Keys, Parts 1 and 2, uh, which I've bought since joining the VC. And uh, I think I'll wrap up the video by talking about that. Just before I joined the VC, I'd started to get a little bit back into metal and hard rock again, because when I got to the age of about sort of 18, 19, I basically lost interest in it. I used to continue reading Kerrang!, but I think what happened was I got into uh, the kind of late 80s, early 90s kind of indie dance thing. Manchester happened, obviously, you know, and I became interested, more kind of more interested in the kind of non, non-metal non music that was happening. I also got very into the Beatles as well, and that kind of took me off in a completely different direction, really. 
and I kind of lost touch with metal. I remember I didn't like Guns N' Roses. Um, I didn't, for so, there was something about them that didn't appeal to me and that kind of was the line in the sand and that's when I kind of lost touch with metal uh, and kind of heavy rock music. But about a year ago, for some reason, just out of nowhere, I think I just decided that I'd like to start listening to kind of heavy stuff again. And a band that I wanted to check out that I'd never checked out before, uh, really, was uh, Slayer. So before I joined the VC, I'd already made these purchases. Um, God Hates Us All, which is an absolutely ferocious album. Uh, South of Heaven. And I got into like blasting these in the car. I just found it good therapy, you know, when you're kind of working and you, you know you can the stresses of family life. Once again, it's that kind of escapist quality which uh, kind of heavy music can often have. Oh, and that's. Um, System of the Down as well. Wow. I bought those before joining the VC, and since joining the VC, thanks to channels such as uh, Andy, Cloudy Milder, I've kind of got into some stuff which I would not otherwise have got into. I really love Opeth. I think they are a fantastic group. I mean, they they just combine everything that I love about music. You know, they've got the progressive side, the melodic side, the heavy side, the light side. You know. Uh, that's their album Damnation, absolutely brilliant. Uh, Metallica, Ride the Lightning, which is a great album, I love that. <laughs> Motorhead, Ace of Spades, I've, I've had that for years. I've got this one uh, to thank Andy for, something I would never have even known about. This is the album um, Forced Entry by Ram, which strongly reminds me of certain kind of 80s things, you know. So yeah, these are some things that I've had uh, from various people since joining the VC. Uh, we have Twisted Sister, Stay Hungry, that was from John Bellamy. Uh, we've had, oh no, actually I bought this myself. I bought this one, uh, Live After Death. Uh, we have Number of the Beast. This was a fine gift uh, from my good VC friend, uh, Dean Everest, which I, um, I, I got it on CD already, uh, but Dean was kind enough to send me uh, a vinyl copy, um, and also uh, this one was sent to me by John Bellamy, Screaming Vengeance by Judas Priest. There are some others as well, but I'm saving them because there's a VC LT video that I need to make. So essentially, uh, that is it. That's my kind of rock and heavy metal collection. I'm sure there are other records on the shelf, I just haven't pulled them because there's only so many hours in the day. Um, but um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please leave comments below. I'd love to hear your thoughts about what I've said and what I've shown. And um, yeah, I will see you soon for another vinyl collection video and uh, lots of other things. So have a great weekend, BC. Take care. Keep spinning that vinyl and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.